from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. I'm joined this week by uh, another military veteran turned uh, entrepreneur and CEO here in San Antonio. We're going to be talking about indoor navigation, tracking, uh, how can that stuff be useful, uh, and uh, maybe what are some of the risks uh, behind either not having that information available for emergency management people or if that information was in the wrong hands. Uh, what could they do and what would it benefit them? I think the uh, the good of having this information outweighs the bad. And if you'll stick with us, you can learn why uh, on uh, how some of the stuff's going to make your life easier uh, in and out of airports and maybe even here in our San Antonio airport. Uh, if you're listening uh, locally on 1200 WAI, if you happen to be listening on iHeartRadio and you come visit San Antonio, uh, you'll get a chance to see uh, some of this company's cool technology uh, in works. Um, so, Gabe, uh, thank you for joining us. If uh, you can share a little bit about uh, your background and how did you end up here running Reckon Point in a building and indoor navigation commercial business? Yeah, well, thank you, Brett, for having me. I really appreciate you guys inviting me onto the show. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, like you said, I'm a Navy veteran, spent six years in the military. Uh, during that time, I did a lot of reconnaissance uh, overland flights, uh, learning how to use radars and stuff like that. Um, that kind of stuck, you know, I love that type of technology. So I decided, Hey, I'm going to gonna get out and go, go to school and learn some more about this stuff. And that's how I got into the engineering side. Um, doing, doing some of that engineering, you know, that's where I learned a lot about signals and stuff like that. And then, uh, kind of did a little bit of work, uh, for some DOD con- companies, uh, BAE and general dynamics and stuff like that. And we used to do a lot of signal intelligence. One of our biggest things was, uh, you know, figuring out where signals are coming from, uh, what kind of signal it was, where it's at. And, um, you know, during some of that, some of that experience, I learned, uh, wow, this is really, really great stuff. And, and one of the shortfalls we always had was how do we know where things are inside? And so when I was going to school and I was working on my thesis, I was like, well, this is really a good topic. You know, maybe I should try to study on figure out how do, how do we find where devices are inside? And that's kind of how, that's kind of how this was born is, is just kind of as a personal challenge as figuring out, wow, you know, there's gotta be a way to do this. And there wasn't really a good way. And, you know, I worked with a couple of fessers and we found we found some rudimentary ways. And right now it looks like we're doing pretty good. We're using magnetics and Wi-Fi and we're, we're getting down to about uh, one and a half meter accuracy, which which is really good right now indoors. Yeah. And that's important if you're trying to give walking directions as an example of a, one of the great use cases. If you're uh, in the airport trying to figure out where you're supposed to go, uh, one and a half meter accuracy is important rather than five or 10 or 20 meter accuracy. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I want to have meter. Uh, that's really good because I'm um, basically you stretch your arms out and, and that's within the space you're going to be there. Um, you know, if you're talking about some of the other some of the other technologies uh, out there using beacons and stuff, they'll give you maybe like five meters, 10 meters. And that could be the difference between you're in this room or the next room. Um, and especially if you're like tracking assets, that's where I think uh, the advantage is for the accuracy where we're thinking about like hospitals and you say, hey, where's this particular MRI machine? You know, some of the portable machines that that are very expensive. Uh, so that's where, you know, you could see where that accuracy would pay off uh, significantly. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a uh, real time uh, asset tracking and we'll uh, go down further uh, into that. But as the airport example, and I, I'm mentioning that because uh, Gabe and Reckon Point were in a, a CivTech San Antonio uh, program this year as so selected as one of two startups to uh, build an, an application for the, the city. And this was working with the San Antonio airport uh, on uh, the location tracking app and a uh, one where if you're going to show up at the airport to pick somebody up, you'll hopefully be able to use their app soon there um, to uh, run into each other within a meter and a half of accuracy instead of, hey, I think I'm by this place over here and it's a cement column. So it'll be good uh, to to have that as well if you're inside and you're looking for a power outlet or other stuff while you're hanging out. Um, all of that asset tracking uh, will be very useful for you. Yeah, that, that that's right on. Uh, yeah, so part of the project that we did for the airport is exactly like you're saying, is uh, we we basically collected all the information inside the airport. We collected all the points of interest, what we call them. And so you can think of like all, every point of interest in the airport could be anything from, like you said, a power plug to a bathroom to uh, some of the breastfeeding facilities and even uh, a lot of the services like the uh, some of the lost baggage uh, offices for like you know Southwest or United you, and and the cool thing about the way the way we did the system the platform for for the city is 
you know, as you see those systems, you can either search for them, right? So it's like an active searchable map. Um, so you can, and things will float to the top. And once you find the item you're searching for, uh, you know, you can click on it and it'll take you to that icon, that place on the map. And then if you want to click on that icon, uh, you actually get more information off that icon. So you can actually look up, okay, what's their phone number? Uh, what times of operation? What are their hours of operation? And you can, you know, it's got a link to their website. So if you need to get more information. So, um, so it provides a very dynamic way for people to actually find information very fast. You know, something people are used to using on, on smartphones already. Yeah, so it's a, like one of the things I think about is that some of the shopping malls in different places now, Google Maps, you can kind of zoom all the way in and you can see the store directory and different things through Google Maps. Uh, that with with those, maybe in an outdoor mall, it works for me to be able to get walking directions to where it's at. But on the, the indoor shopping malls, not so much. Correct. Yeah, not so much. So, yeah, we've done a lot of testing with the GPS indoors and uh the big thing with GPS is you got to have that line of sight, right? So your your phone, if your phone can't see the satellites, you're, it's not going to work. Um, so anytime there's a roof overhead or trees or even even downtown where what they call urban canyons, yeah, uh, the, the buildings tend to block that line of sight. So a lot of a lot of people think that the satellites are right above your head. They're actually not. A lot of times they're they're off in the horizon. You know, they might be like right above the horizon. And um, so there's a big problem actually even even downtown uh, where you get into what they call these urban canyons and, and GPS kind of sort of works. Yeah. Um, sometimes it puts you a block away. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I normally have GPS turned off on my phone as well. So when I turn it on, when I need to use it, um, I, I appear all over downtown here. I was going to pick a car up yesterday and I think it, it put me right in the middle of a construction site for where the, the new uh, high rise is going up uh, <laughs> about two blocks away from uh, where our studios are at. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, I always have to drag the little pin on the map back to where I, I'm actually at. Yep. Yep. And so that's, that's, uh, that's a big, uh, that's a big problem in downtowns. And I think the, the technology we're using, um, the, the great thing about the way we're doing it is we can actually augment, uh, GPS indoors and outdoors. Um, one of the big ideas that we've been kicking around is, is like the, uh, here in San Antonio is the, uh, Riverwalk. Um, I don't know if you've tried to use GPS down there to, to find your way around. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I I have it off most of the time. I'm a little bit of a, a privacy dork in that aspect. But, yeah, I mean, it's not going to work very well. There's a nice tree canopy. There's lots of wonderful buildings along both sides. It's below street level. There's all sorts of things that's going to make GPS not behave very well. Right, yep. So that's that's one of the things that we, we've thought about. I th- we think it would be a really cool project to do something like that here at the city is uh, – you know, we, we see a lot of potential basically because it's uh it's a little crazy navigating down there because the, it's uh, so many S turns throughout the river and I, I think that would be a pretty neat project for us to do. But uh, yeah, no, it's a, a another a good example of places where this um, technology could be useful. It's still it's outdoors, um, but it's a complex walkable environment. And, and the river walk there, the difference between one and a half meters is standing on the sidewalk or standing in the river. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, accuracy matters in that aspect. So uh, from a, a tech perspective, uh, let's uh, kind of walk through uh, what does it take to get this kind of thing uh, set up and going? Are you plugging beacon devices in all over the place? Are you using existing technology that's already present in someone's building? Yep. Yep. That's actually a very good question. Uh, so, so the way we developed this, one of the things that we did on the onset is how can we use um, what we call uh, signals of opportunity, right? And that's one of the things we've always tried to do, especially when I was in the SIGINT business is like there's all, all kinds of signals already in the environment. And so the idea is how do, how do we take advantage of what's already in the environment and not have to install any infrastructure, right? And so that's kind of where we, we decided, hey, let's let's take a look at the existing uh, access points. Uh, most facilities already have a ton of access points, like San Antonio Airport. I mean, they have a, a full up infrastructure for free Wi-Fi and within their their, their corporate Wi-Fi as well. Yeah. Um, and so what we do is we actually look at all the beacons. Most most access points, what they're doing is they're always broadcasting their SSIDs. Um, you know, it says SA free Wi-Fi or it says, you know, uh, San Antonio free wi- uh, airport free Wi-Fi. So you see these beacons that are always broadcast. So what we do is we, we actually um, create what they call signatures off these. And the signature technology has kind of been around for a while and they're starting to use it a lot in, in other fields. Um, and we found that we got pretty good results just using Wi-Fi beacons alone. Uh, and then uh, to augment that, what we do is we also use the, the ambient magnetic fields within within the building. And. Um, basically what we say ambient magnetic fields is just basically like the North Pole, right? Um, so those, those lines, as, as they're flowing through a building, uh, what happens is they get warped. Um, so you can think of kind of like electricity. It wants to take the, uh, 
takes the path of least resistance. So any, anywhere there's metal within the building, those, those field lines get distorted. And so we actually have a robot that when it's traversing the space, you know, our robot is going throughout the building, he's actually collecting uh, the pattern. He's actually mapping the, all the distortion of magnetic fields as well as, as well as mapping all the RF signals from the Wi-Fi. And so between those two maps that we create, um, that's how we're able to correlate where, where a person is, you know, using their device. We're actually not tracking the person. We're actually tracking the device itself. Um, so that's, that's how we're able to do all the, all the indoor positioning very accurately. Yeah. So then if you're, uh, it's like the airport there, if you've got a, a, a handicap uh, cart that you need to be able to locate for a passenger um, that's uh, headed off of a plane or that's uh, in a security area and you, you need to be able to get them to their gate or terminal, uh, from a, an airport operations perspective, they could see immediately where that's at. You could see uh, where did it go pick them up. You could see what speed potentially you could track all the information that it drove to go get them to the terminal. And and uh, all the, the rest of that recording information could be uh, accurate and available. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's another that's another great thing about the technology is, is it gives you, like you said, the uh, navigation and wayfinding portion. Uh, but it also gives you the asset tracking portion. So what we're looking to build out is like a dashboard where um, let's say you had different operations going on and they, they basically they could look at a map, a real time map and see, OK, here's where all my wheelchairs are at. Um, here's where my uh, my assistant staff is at. Uh, here's why, where my security staff is at. So you could actually have different views and see in real time where they're going. And then also on top of that, like like you mentioned, you can see the, the historical data uh, and start getting into like, you know, the data analytics side of it is like. You know where where's traffic flowing? Um, you know, like you said, how long did it take to pick up passengers and move passengers from point A to point B? And start building all those all those uh, data analytics for like uh, operation efficiency type stuff. You're listening to 1200 WAI. This is Cyber Talk Radio, and I'm your host Brett Pyatt. I'm joined this week by Gabe Garza, uh, CEO of Reckon Point, and we're talking about uh, internal location tracking and some of the the technology associated with that, signals and other different ways. Uh, that all these things can work. If you uh, just turned your radio on right now, you can listen to a rebroadcast or replay of this episode on Tuesday, September 18th. It'll go up on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. It'll also go on to uh, ideally every podcasting service on the internet. If you use a podcasting service where you cannot find our program, uh, reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, Let us know what that service is. Uh, We will get it added, and we will get you a CyberTalk Radio t-shirt. Gabe, as uh, you're going through here, so you were working on this project um, for the airport. This is uh, one we talked a little bit about uh, the uh, use for maybe the the river walk, and then there's some asset tracking uh, benefits to this. One of the things uh, is we we think from a, like, cybersecurity, which bleeds over into physical security, as you talk about critical infrastructure and some of these other areas, uh, for places like the airport right now, uh, they've got a lot of security personnel. They're running a lot of, of different training and plans. But, I mean, I just know from uh, kind of common sense right now, they don't have necessarily an accurate count of number of people in a building and number of people in an area or a facility um, at any point in time. You could, like, freeze frame a, a security camera and start counting. Uh, but to be able to get down to, uh, if you needed to evacuate an area, um, it could be hours or days before you were certain that you got everybody evacuated if something did happen to a certain wing. This is one, like, as we look at, at like technology like Reckon Point's building uh, from a, a public safety perspective, do you have um, p- people reaching out to you that are responsible for, for that aspect of, of this? I know, like, convenience and ease of use is one great thing in the, the airport, as an example, but um, all of these sports venues, uh, the rest of it, where uh, events could happen, and I think I know there's lots of planning going on all the time. This seems like a wonderful technology to apply in those situations as well. Yeah, yeah, we've actually had a couple companies uh, reach out to us about that. Um, some of the use cases that that they've mentioned to us is uh, is uh, airports and uh, schools. Uh, you know, some of the things that we we don't want to think about, like active shooters, you know, yeah. and, and terrorist activities. Uh, but uh, this technology does provide the ability for people, you know, one of the things we're looking at is for like E911 uh, uh, response type stuff is where you could check in and send your location to uh, what they call PSAP. That's basically the uh, infrastructure that's used for the local 911s. Um, so one of the things we, we, we have uh, done some research on is on mobile devices, typically when you do call 911, um, they try to triangulate using cell phone towers. And um, But right now the system is very disjointed. 
Um, so they don't always get a very accurate um, position on where you're at. And sometimes your phone, your call actually gets relayed to the wrong county. Um, but with our, our technology, because the accuracy we do get, um, using some of the some of the back end type stuff, we'd be able to get the uh, lat long of where someone is and actually have that data routed to the right 911 center uh, in, the, in the exact region you're in. And on top of that, um, with the maps, uh, the digital maps and the indoor location, the first responders would actually be able to know exactly where you are within that building. You know, you uh, could potentially give the first responders the most efficient path to get from entrance of building to the the person as well. Not only where are they, but you, as I've seen the tech, you could draw a line of like, here's the place to go. Absolutely. Yep. We could tell them exactly, Hey, you know, they, you know, take, take this ramp, go in this, this door on the elevator, you know, on the elevators and, and, you know, take this door from, from the parking garage. Uh, that way they know exactly how, how to get there instead of, you know, searching, you know, what's, what's the best way to access this person. Um, so we, we are looking, you know, to work with some companies like that to expand that technology. Um, we see a lot of, you know, we see a lot of, a lot of, uh, stuff advantages in that. And where, especially you think even just simple, and I wouldn't say simple, but you could think about, uh, you know, uh, medical emergencies, um, such as, you know, a stroke or a heart attack time is of the essence. Right. Yeah. And you think about, you know, paramedics trying to get there and they get to the airport and they ask someone on the curb, Hey, where, where's the emergency? And, you know, someone on the curb standing around is like, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine if you're um, in a hotel and you have a heart attack and you're in your room and you dial 911 from your cell phone, um, if you can't communicate, I'm in room 2112, right. it, it may take them quite a while to find wh- where you're at, which as the time is of the essence, they may not get there. Exactly, yep. And that's and that's how you can see where this, this technology would, would be very beneficial in those types of cases for, for first responders, you know, whether it's evacuation, uh, fire or, you know, uh, med- yeah. medical emergencies. Yeah. So interesting stuff. So you did your, your thesis on this and you, you, um, I mean, there's lots of, uh, military applications for accuracy of these sorts of things as well. And you, you've got a background in both. What made you decide to go out into the private sector and, and work with cities and, and, uh, private industry to go, uh, commercialize this technology yeah so so one of the things was um you know i was living up in new england for a while and i I grew up here in san antonio and so one of the things i thought you know is like you know i kind of want to go back to san antonio and 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 develop some you know this technology i think it's it would benefit the uh the i think the general population uh i've worked on a lot of dod projects and a lot of them are obviously very classified and and sometimes we have some really good stuff. And I think, you know, I, I was thinking this is very beneficial for the public. And I don't think this is something that should be locked up in a closet. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it's and then it gives us another step to move forward and to just kind of let's let's leap bound forward and, 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 you know, just move forward in our technology in the civilian sector. So and we, we've heard um, in the past there have been some uh, articles out there on the the commercialization of some of these uh, tracking technologies so whether it's where you're going on the internet or uh, Nordstrom uh, a number of years ago they were using some uh, real uh, inaccurate exact positioning but they were doing some beacon tracking of, of devices in their stores and they could see who you were how long you spent in the store what you bought and those sorts of things uh, from a, a data privacy perspective, uh, kind of what are your thoughts on, and we've talked about a lot of the, the good uses of this, how this stuff can help um, from an efficiency of operations, how it can help save lives in the event of, of incidents, but how on the, the sort of advertising tracking um, where uh, maybe people value their, their privacy, uh, what thoughts do you have on, on that aspect of all these sorts of things? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important question, um, and that's something we've given a lot of thought to. And so, one of the things we have done is is uh, we do we do um, allow people to opt out from the tracking. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, like yourself, that say, "Hey, I, you know, I don't want every motion of you know every event in my life being tracked." Yeah. Um, so there, so there are like the way we're we're breaking out the system right now is there's one that does actually give you like about ninety percent of the f- functionality where you can actually see the maps, and you can actually navigate from point A to point B. Um, and what that what that uh, particular uh, baseline does is it doesn't do the actual tracking of you. So if you wanted to know where you're at in the airport, you wouldn't be able to know where you're at in the airport. Um, neither does the system. Yeah. Uh, but you can still use the maps, and you can still find all the points of interest. Um, but on on the tracking itself, one of the things we've done um, to separate uh, people's identity is we we actually don't authenticate um, our apps. Basically, when you get on and use the app, we don't track 
the person itself. We basically create a, a hash code. Um, so we're actually just tracking the hash code uh, throughout space, right? And so we're not actually uh, tying that to any demographics or like any any user identities within within the application. So we've uh, we've done a number of episodes on data privacy, and you can list, look those up in our archives at uh, www.cybertalkradio.com, or if you would like to see a YouTube uh, still photo of my guests and uh, myself, uh, we're also on YouTube. It just uh, try to get that content out there and make it easy and accessible uh, for folks in the places they want to go consume it. Uh, but in those, some of those data privacy ones, there have been all this news about Facebook and Google tracking everything we do online these days. And I went into, I'm going to call it a little bit of a rant, but it's like Google and Facebook are, are tracking one aspect that um, in, from all of the rest of the stuff out there, our data has been tracked on people and data privacy of what you're doing has have been uh, something that's been sold for the longest time. You go back to the Nielsen ratings and people were excited to be a Nielsen household so they could give away what they watched on television and I don't know what benefit you actually got for it. You could just put the cool family on the block for being the Nielsen family. But uh, like with the, the cell phone tracking uh, and folks, we all have our cell phones on us almost all the time now. Um, and there's cell phone towers around and there's the cell phone towers from your cell phone provider, but there's the cell phone towers from all the other providers as well. And so each of those providers can see, all of our phones all the time. It's not that your phone is just talking to your tower. Your phone's just actually authenticating a handshake with your cell provider, but it's still ending up sending signals to all the rest. So any cell provider can see, even if you're not their customer, um, if you're in the area around their tower and where you're generally at. So they can see their market share in a given area. Uh, they can know, like at the Super Bowl, um, how many people attended the Super Bowl that are our customer versus somebody else's customer. And if we're going to run an advertisement um, sponsoring a sports team, um, does that help us win more market share at that sports arena than um, at arenas we don't advertise at? So this data privacy and location tracking and a lot of this information, uh, I think is you, you may go, well, you know what? Um, the stuff that Gabe's working on is creepy. I don't want it. There's a lot of it out there that folks are just not talking about this, and they're not using it for good. Um, I mean, I think the great thing here of what Reckon Point's working on, as you hear Gabe saying, is they're going through to take this tracking to uh, make lives better uh, for folks um, on the usability side of things, to make lives better for first responders, um, to pr protect and provide safety for all of us. So uh, it's this uh, constant ebb and flow of... Uh, privacy versus utility and um, if you are trading some of these things is it being used for good or is it being used for profit is it being used for evil um, and this is a, a one where uh, I think we want the the good guys to have as much information as they can because the the folks out there that are doing bad they may be hacking into Wi-Fi hotspots or they may go place their rogue hotspots um, all over town so they can uh, run uh, demographic tracking information. If you've got a, a Wi-Fi router at, at your house or your office and you've not patched or updated it in a long time, uh, please go look up the model number on there, put it on the internet, see if you can put some new firmware on it because uh, you may be inadvertently compromising the privacy of uh, all of your employees and all of the people in, in the area or your family and your friends and neighbors when they come over to your house because this is the dark web, uh, and there are people out there that uh, may want to do uh, bad things with the information that you're sharing on accident. So we're uh, going to take a quick break here coming up for a news, traffic, and weather update on 1200 WAI. If you're listening to us on uh, one of the podcasting services and streaming, uh, you will not get a news, traffic, and weather update. It will just cut straight through to the second segment of the program. In this uh, back half, we will be uh, talking about uh, the robot. You may have heard Gabe mention it uh, briefly, but we'll getting some more details about what is this robot what is it doing uh, how do you build stuff like this and if you're listening out there and thought you know what i would love to work for a company like reckon point uh, we'll also have gabe share uh, kind of from an engineering perspective what stuff should you be studying uh, what do you need to learn uh, how do you go about uh, building the uh, knowledge and skills uh, to be able to go do these type of things yourself uh, so we will uh, be back here real quick on 1200 wai after a news traffic and weather update Welcome back to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. I'm joined this week by Gabe Garza, CEO of Reckon Point, and we're talking about 
uh, indoor tracking, uh, and uh, some of the great things you can do with that. If you uh, just turned on your radio here after the break, you can listen to the rebroadcast of this uh, on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com or on any of your uh, favorite podcasting services. And if you happen to have a favorite podcasting service you can't find our program on, uh, reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook. We will get you a CyberTalk Radio t-shirt, and we will get our program added to that uh, podcasting platform. So the first half of the program, Gabe, we kind of talked about some of the CivTech uh, SA stuff you're doing with the San Antonio airport. Uh, and, and as we were going through that conversation, you mentioned a robot. Okay, so this is not just software and, and Wi-Fi and, and other pieces, but uh, explain um, how do you go about building a robot and like what sort of uh, knowledge do you need to learn to build a robot? Because like, I know how to write software and maybe a lot of people that work around here, like I can go online to Codecademy or something else. I can figure out how to write software, but figuring out how to build a robot sounds more complicated. Yeah, well, it's, it's a very different... Uh different approach uh there is actually believe it or not there's actually a lot of software development in building a robot um but uh, one of the robots that we built uh what we do is uh, we found that you know doing a manual method of collecting all these signals and data um was very time consuming um also very inaccurate so one of the things we needed was a way to collect all these signals and all this data very accurately we wanted to tag all the data down to like two centimeter accuracy in order to get the accuracy that we do for indoor positioning uh, so we said, hey, let's develop a platform. And believe it or not, the robot started um, as a push cart. Uh, one of the, the first versions of it, we basically had kind of like some Raspberry Pis, and we, we attached a bunch of sensors on it, and, and we were you know pushing this around on, on like a shopping cart. <laughs> there you go. And uh, we wrote a bunch of code in Python. Uh, so we were actually running Python in real time, and we you know time tagging all the data as it's coming in. And then we, we, we take all those time tags, correlate the data afterwards. Uh, and you know, that worked really great, except for, uh, you run into a problem where you, you figure out, well, where's ground truth? Where was I at this time? Uh, and yeah. so we kept running into that problem. Like, okay, well I wrote it down in my notes, but, and then it's like, well, I don't know. My, I skipped like two minutes and I got like two minutes missing in my notes. I don't know where I was for those two minutes. Uh -oh. I, don't know, I don't know where that, where that data is or where it belongs. So, and it doesn't, it doesn't take much of a, an error to where if you, you end up off by a meter and then you drive along and then everything else after that is off by a meter. And that's how you end up with the, the lack of accuracy that you see in most of the systems out there. Right. That's okay. It. So you, you went from, from push cart now to, to robot. And for those out there listening, uh, should they be picturing something that looks like R2D2 or like, what does this robot look like now? So, so you could think this robot kind of looks more like, um, it's, uh, it's got like a wing, kind of like a bat wing on top. And on that bat wing, we have a dome, uh, that, that, that dome has six cameras that are, you know, basically, uh, looking 360. They have about, uh, 60 degrees overlap each one. So we're, you know, as we're traversing the space, we can actually collect, uh, 360 images. On that back wing, bat wing up front, we have three antennas. Uh, that's basically three channels that we use for RF collection for all the Wi-Fi. Um, underneath those, uh, underneath those antennas, we have uh, three magnetic sensors that are collecting all the magnetic data. Very sensitive uh, magnetic sensors underneath there. Um, uh, and then, in addition, we have two other very advanced sensors. Um, one of them is an IMU. Uh, which is, uh, you know, maybe a lot, I think a lot of your listeners will understand what a MEM sensor is, but uh, basically it's a, uh, an IMU is basically an uh, uh, inertial navigation unit, um, and it, it takes the accelerometer data, gyro data, and magnetometer data, and it can tell the attitude, kind of like an aircraft, like pitch, roll, and yaw, uh, yeah. very accurately. So the one we use is, is quite expensive. Uh, its accuracy is probably down to like, uh, you know, 0 0.1 degrees accuracy. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe a lot of listeners out there, if you've bought one of the little uh, things in your car that you can use to test your acceleration or braking distance or even maybe some of the, the fancier ones that you could drive a, a lap around a track and it'll track you on there. Uh, Gabe's talking about stuff like that, but much more accurate than the, the $119 uh, one you get for, for doing the tracking stuff with your car. Correct, correct, exactly. So so the one we have is it's a, it's a little bit more expensive. Um and it is very accurate. Uh, so we take that, that IMU data, uh, and then uh, we couple that with what they call a LIDAR. Um, uh, some of your listeners might know what a LIDAR is as well, which a lot of the autonomous vehicles coming around. Yeah, we've done a, an episode of the program talking some about the ethics of self-driving cars and went through uh, some of the pieces of, of technology uh, involved there. But yeah, that's uh, LIDARs the, the CF, yeah, that the cars are using. Um, some of them are working better than others. Uh, yeah, so... Right. Yep. And You're on the so, cutting edge in a lot of areas here. It sounds like. Yes. So so the, so we are pushing the envelope on some a lot of this technology. So we we take this lidar, 
uh, we couple the LiDAR with the IMUs. And then also we have uh, on our wheels, we have what they call encoders, right? The encoders basically uh, can figure out how far a wheel has traveled and then, you know, just time and distance. You can you can kind of figure out what they call odometry, right? Figuring out how far you've traveled uh, just based on wheel spin. Yeah, and that goes all the way back to your cars. We used to have analog odometers on there, and if you would go change the size of tire on your car and not reconfigure the odometer, your mileage could be off by quite a bit. So if you're going to buy a classic car and you, you look and it's got big, giant tires on it now, um, the actual mileage on that car is going to be much higher than what's been recorded because the odometer was calibrated to the factory tire size and um, it, each rotation of that big tire is a much further distance traveled than the rotation of the standard size tire. So as you, you think through on calibrating all of these systems, uh, you're, you're driving around your, your robot and your robot got some gum stuck to one of its wheels, all of a sudden you're off by a little bit again. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, so that's one of the things where, where we, so, you know, one of the big things in developing the robot, we said we need this accuracy. Uh, we figured that how do we know what I was telling, what's ground truth, right? How do we really know where we are within two centimeters um, so we can tag all this data? And so that's where we, we, we did a lot of research and figured that, you know, with the LiDAR, um, you know, we have 16 lasers on this LiDAR. It's bouncing off all the walls. So you can back triangulate exactly where that, that center point is of the LiDAR. And then you correlate that with the um, the IMU, so you know exactly what angle the lidar was pointing at that specific time. And then you take the information from the odometers as well. And when you couple all this information together, um, you're actually uh, calculating exactly where you were um, at every position. And it's it's what they call a SLAM technology, simultaneous localization and mapping. So so some of the algorithms we develop is a SLAM SLAM algorithms to know exactly where we're at within the space and. And that's uh, it's pretty pretty advanced technology. A lot of a lot of engineering, a lot of coding, uh, a lot of math. Um, and so that's how we came upon the, the the robot. And one of the experiments we did uh, when we were at the old building uh, over where the Wiseware uh, building was, uh, we used to be co-located with them, and we did that space by hand, uh, basically using our handheld uh, you know cell phones and stuff, collecting all this data. Um, and what, what we did is when we went to collect the data in that, that space, it took us about a week to get very accurate data. Uh, then once we built the robot, we managed to knock out actually a higher density of data in 15 minutes. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> so yeah. you can see, you can see the, the vast improvement. And that, that's one of the things that makes Reckon Point very unique is that we have that, that engineering horsepower to develop things like that. And, and so this, this robot now is on, uh, can you, would you call this one version 1.0 yet? I think we're on like version 1.5. We have the original version. Uh, basically, he's all metal. Uh, yeah. He looks like like uh, kind of like uh, almost like a, a scrap metal. It's just bare aluminum. Uh, the the other two that we've just built recently this year, uh, you know, they have some nice uh, paint. You know, some powder coating. Uh, they got some more CNC type. Uh, built parts and a little bit yeah. better design so so they're those are much nicer <laughs> there you go so you're up to a few different robots now at this point correct we have three in operations right now and so they, they help a lot uh, we can run those simultaneously um, some of the future stuff that we're looking at is uh, and this is a lot more in the technology side is uh, autonomous how do we how do we make these guys autonomous so they rove you know go in the airport go in these large uh, you know convention centers hospitals and uh, collect this data autonomously and report all the data, you know, back to the cloud, uh, you know, autonomously. Uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, and it's interesting to think, since you were talking and I was watching uh, your presentation at CivTech, uh, that you guys categorized uh, locations of all the fire extinguishers in the airport again. So another example of something that could be handy from a public safety, uh, if you know where all those are at. You're going through marking some of those by hand now, but with the the 360 cameras on there and some image recognition training, uh, a few generations into the future, not only could you identify uh, the exact location of stuff, but you may be able just to mark those assets um, that are should be located in a consistent spot, like a fire extinguisher or a power outlet, uh, by having the robot drive through and then feeding that image into uh, your image recognition. Yeah, you're you're right on target. Uh, so I don't know if you've been 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 looking at our like our, our secret Scunt Works projects, but that's no. uh, <laughs> you're right on target on that, Brett. We're actually been working on that. We have some. Uh, we have actually uh, we just uh, put uh, what they call. I don't know if you're familiar with the TX2s, um, but Nvidia has come out with some embedded GPUs. Uh, yeah. It's got about 256 cores, uh, embedded GPU about the size of a credit card. And believe it or not, we just upgraded our robots, put some of those on there, and what we're doing is we're taking those six cameras. 
and we're running uh, artificial intelligence with the convolution neural network on there. And we are doing real-time object detection and classification. Uh, and so what we do is, is we're training the algorithms right now exactly for what you're speaking is we're able to recognize doors, uh, windows, computers, uh, uh, actually mobile phones. Uh, one of the things we want to do is set, set up another training set, like you said, is for uh, maintenance. And so we can actually categorize all the, the fire extinguishers, uh, the overhead sprinkler systems, the, the fire detectors, because uh, that's a lot of the maintenance stuff that, that requires annual or quarterly inspections. And yeah. we see a lot of value in that. Uh, we've got some feedback from a lot of architects that say, um, you know, it, it, there's no good way right now for them to categorize that besides, you know, like they have like an Excel sheet. <laughs> yeah, or a clipboard. Exactly. And someone's kind of walking around looking for it and, and wondering where this at so they can do an inspection. And so there's a lot of uh, advantages to having a robot do it. I mean, we're already in the space. We might as well inventory everything while we're there. Yeah. I mean, you go through thinking of inventory, uh, good guy and bad guy stuff. And we, we generally uh, here get out a little bit of the thoughts of of that as well. Like in the airport, there's a bunch of security cameras that the airport wants there. Those are their cameras, uh, but it would not be impossible for somebody to mount a battery powered camera uh, recording some stuff uh, in the airport. You could bring one through in your, in your carry on uh, through security and you could mount and stick one up on a wall somewhere. You may get arrested for this and go to jail or you might not get caught, but your robot driving around could list out and go, hey, here's a camera, and this one's a different model than all the rest of them, and as, as the image recognition gets better, so you could help from a preventative maintenance um, and detection on different things like that as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. In the future, you could imagine that these robots are basically kind of like maintenance rovers, right? They, they would be roving around and actually doing the inspections. Yeah. You know? Okay, yeah, this fire extinguisher is still here, and you know these things are still intact, and also doing you know some, some uh, security-type uh, scans where you know there's some unknown devices in the ceiling now or there's unknown yeah. unknown attachments on these atms or, or or strange strange stuff like that yeah you could see uh wi-fi signals from a coming from a skimmer on an atm because uh so like if you guys have had your credit card stolen out there via gas station or whatever else there's also skimmers that get dropped into the the front of a little atm machine and those all have a battery and a little embedded signal broadcasting in it. So if the robot's driving around not only looking physically at stuff, but could be uh, listening on the signals, um, you could see, uh, yeah, if, if there's signals there that shouldn't be. Or we, we all hop on the, the free Wi-Fi at the airport and other places. Uh, but the way Wi-Fi works, uh, for those uh, out there that uh, don't understand, it's a uh, strongest signal wins. Um, so if I had a router in my backpack that I brought through security again and I was sitting there and I wanted to name my broadcast network on that router SA free Wi-Fi and you're sitting next to me you're going to get the router in my backpack you're not going to actually get the real SA free Wi-Fi the airport I think would also love to know in right. all, all sorts of places convention centers um, all of those would love to know if somebody is there trying to do things to their customers uh, that is uh, unethical, potentially illegal. That is, that, that is correct. That's what we call rogue, rogue access points. Yeah. Um, and we actually uh, actually have a good story about that. Um, uh, not necessarily a rogue access point. When we we're actually doing scans at the airport, uh, you know, we're, we're collecting all this data, uh, and then we do analysis on the data to figure out. You know, we filter out all kinds of d different data. It's like we don't we don't need this, we don't need that. There's a lot of hotspots that you see that people are using. We don't want hotspots. And then yeah. printers. You know, we filter out printers. Um, but you can see a lot of susceptible devices that we saw in there were like like you know some printers that were non secured. Uh, the other thing we found is we actually found a device in the in the airport that was misbehaving, and uh, they had no idea. So I think it was one of their. Um, access points but basically what happens is uh it was stuck um just gonna reboot loop. just it was, it actually was stuck just broadcasting a ton of noise so it was actually jamming some of the nearby uh wi-fi access points so uh, we brought that up to their it department and they were like wow how did you guys find that and we're like well yeah a robot picks up a lot of things <laughs> no that's it's i uh, mean good stuff because it's hard in a facility that size where you have hundreds potentially thousands of antennas um spread out across that building um, the antennas and most of those wireless uh, mesh type services, in theory, the people, the other antennas in the area should communicate some stuff back of like, hey, like antenna number 12 over here is doing some weird stuff, but sometimes they don't pick it all up. So it's good to have a separate system doing some checks and balances uh, across all of those different things. Right, right. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that, that's uh, some, some, of the, some of the advantages that we have with the platform because it's just very sensitive and it's very calibrated. And I think that's where a lot of the... Uh, 
a lot of the engineering horsepower and a lot of the background that we have at, here at Reckon Point um, that we bring to the table besides, you know, developing the technologies, you know, yeah. develop stuff like that. So from a, a education perspective, building this robot, you, you, you go to, to college, electrical engineering, computer engineering, computer engineering, robotics, like what, what sort of educational path would help you as a, a student out there learn the things needed to, to set up a robot like that? Yeah, so definitely uh, to, for this background, if you're just, you know, we're talking about the robot, you know, the robotic pieces as far as driving it and, and building it, that part of it is going to definitely going to be mechanical and electrical engineering because you got to learn about motors. You got to learn about some of the microcontrollers to control the motors, the signals to. Yeah. Your motors have to not make noise that <laughs> stops you from being able to pick up all the other noise. Right, yeah. exactly. So, so learning uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, because uh, you got to learn, you know, some of the structure type components uh and some of the you know gearing ratios and like you said some of the math as far as like figuring out okay some like you were talking about odometry like so many rotations equals yeah. uh so much displacement right um and so definitely uh mechanical engineering electrical engineering uh i think when you start getting a little bit into some of the algorithms um I think a lot of that is still uh, electrical engineering and and software. Uh, where you start getting yeah, some of the software, some engineering. of the computer science uh, algorithms, data structures, moving on in the artificial intelligence side of things into, yeah, neural nets or um, all sorts of other different artificial intelligence data structures. Right. Yep. Yeah. Learning the different types of networks, like the convolution neural networks. Uh, also, um, believe it or not, uh, and a lot one of the things I tell a lot of my engineers is. Is uh, some a lot of these are, are you know fancy words, but when when it, when you break it down, uh, a lot of the artificial intelligence and the machine learning, um, it basically comes down to statistics. Yeah. Uh, you know they're using Bayesian math, they're using linear regression. Uh, so fundamentally, regardless of the method that you're using to process the data, you, you kind of break it down, and you're still using statistics. Yeah, so if you're you're taking these high school classes on math and you're like, well, how is this ever going to be useful? Or or high school physics and and you're wondering like, why are they teaching me uh, this uh, stuff on the rolling resistance and all the rest of the stuff you're doing in physics or electricity and magnetism yeah. and Static the fields friction, coming off yes. of that? Yeah, <laughs> all these things. You're like, how is this actually ever going to be useful? Well, it's useful if you work at Reckon Point. Uh, all that that those things that you learned. Um, all have practical uses every day. Absolutely. So that's that's a great example, Brett. Uh, like when you talk about static friction, is that's one of the biggest things that that we have with motors, right? Yeah. And you say, uh, when, when you're building a, a robot, and you say, okay, how much torque do I need to to move fifty pounds, right? And you think about, well, okay, I want to apply enough torque so he 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 moves steady. I don't want him to jerk because I got yeah. all these sensors on it, right? So I don't want to induce all the noise into the sensor. So you're figuring out how how much torque do I need to apply. And how much do I need to apply on carpet? How much do I need exactly. to apply on cement floor? How much do I need to apply in, uh, on if right. it's going up a slope because there's a ramp that I'm now on? Right. And, and, yeah. and, we, and exactly. And we say, and I, you know, I tell the engineers, okay, so let's do some tests and, and let's collect the data. And we figure out, okay, how much data do we need to collect per meter, right? And we figure out, okay, so basically we got to travel at 0.3 meters per second. Yeah. And like you said, how can I travel 0.3 meters per second in all those different environments? Uphill, downhill, carpet, floor, concrete. Uh, yeah. And so you figure out, okay, so now my motor controller has to be smart enough to apply more power or less power. And not only that, but to each wheel, what if one wheel slips, right? And that's where, like you said, where a lot of the math comes in and you, and you figure out, and that's where static friction comes in is in physics. And you're like, okay, how much, because it always takes more power to get going than once you're going. You yeah. Know? Just like when you're trying to push a, a car that's, that's, you know, stuck on the side of the road. Once you get it going, it's okay. But it takes like three people just to get it yeah. moving. Inertia is a real thing. <laughs> so, so, and static friction versus kinetic friction. Static right. friction is higher. Much, much yes. higher. And and so you, so you see how, um, and that's where you know I talk to a lot of the engineers and even a lot of the high school students. I, I tell them that if you're going to go into you know fields like this, you will use math. And sometimes you don't really know you're using math. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of times you say, well, you know, I'm going to use like a PID controller, and you're like. And you know, and, I, and and what I do is I always try to try to dig with my with my, my team, dig a little deeper. It's like, what what is the PID controller doing? I go, let's break it down. And they're like, well, it's a proportional integral differentiator. I go, it's math, it's calculus. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's definitely yeah. Um, so if, yeah, if you want to be building the building blocks, <laughs> you you definitely need the math. But even to understand which building blocks to use, you need the math. Correct. correct. Yeah. And so that's where I start, that's where we always uh, tend to. Uh, 
uh, you know, tell our engineers, and even we, we get a lot of interns, high school interns uh, that come on board, and that's one of the things, you know, we'll, we'll give them some good tasks to, uh, to work on some of, the, some of the code and teach them about some of these basic, basic algorithms and how they work and the math behind them. So I always like to stress some of the math behind the engineering. So because that, at, at the lowest level, regardless of what language you're programming, whether you're programming assembly, basic, Python, C, C++, the fundamental theory, the physics, is not going to change. The no. syntax will change, but the physics will not. And so, on the on the programming side, um, I've heard you say on the the uh, show here that yeah, you're using some Python. Uh, I heard in your presentation from a, an operations perspective, kind of underneath the Python, it's running in a Kubernetes cluster. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, in in up in the uh, cloud, we're running a Kubernetes cluster, and and what we're doing there is running uh, basically a bunch of Dockers. Uh, so, a lot of the cloud processing uh, that's being done, and we do that so that it scales faster. What we do is we have a basically a Docker swarm, and each each container basically serves serves uh, can serve about two or three uh, devices simultaneously. And so the way we set that up is is basically to queue, right? Uh, as the more demand goes up, we spin off more containers, and so it it becomes very robust. So, you know, at any time in the airport, there might be a hundred users, and then what happens is two or three planes will land, and you'll get a spike in users. And and so we had to we had to account for that. Is like how do we scale super fast so that when we go from a hundred users and all of a sudden we have six hundred users and we need to scale super fast. Uh, you know these these uh, containers we're looking at. They spin off. They're spinning off in milliseconds, and they're ready up in service very very fast. So so that's one of the one of the things that we we did some research on and figured out what was the best way to do that. Yeah, because it's it's really expensive if you're designing a computing system if you have to design for peak capacity uh, versus being able to design for. Uh, just the actual utilization over time, especially in a system like the the airport there where you've got a lot of variance. Uh, but it's like our road systems is another really easy example. I mean, in San Antonio, people complain about traffic, but I think everyone does in every city in America. Um, newsflash folks from San Antonio, we don't really have that much traffic here. <laughs> uh, but during your rush hour, it's stuff, it's congested, it's slowed down. Sure would be nice if you could just scale up the roads during rush hour and then scale them back down. Right, uh, right. I mean, same Tri- thing. Triple the lanes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, same thing. Like in the physical world, it's hard to, to, to do these things. In the computing world, it's not that hard. Um, and like when people complain about uh, parking in uh, San Antonio, I've got some stats on that. Um, my numbers tell me that we've got eight parking spaces per automobile. So there's not a shortage of parking. There's just a, a very... Um, inefficient allocation of it and uh, th- that includes the parking spaces in your own driveway and all the rest of those but you just think about uh, all that stuff around and, it, and you can't dynamically scale it up and scale it down but if you could it would be so much more efficient and you can do these things on the computing side of the world and that's uh, how you're able to go and, and build and apply um, and offer a robust and affordable service out to uh, your customers from a, a product development perspective. Yeah, absolutely, and that's definitely what, one of the one of the reasons we did that. And uh, you know, we want to be able to to scale in that manner because you're right. Having you know, if you, if you compare the containers to uh, virtual machines, and you had you know 100 virtual machines running 24 seven, that gets very expensive very fast. Yeah. Uh, so you see, it definitely. Uh, so where where are you guys going from here? You so uh, I'm gonna finish the CivTech SA uh, phase one. Um, what else is is up in the the horizon for Reckon Point? I think so, a couple of the big projects we're looking at in the horizon right now is one of the things we're looking at is convention centers. Uh, start expanding into convention centers. Uh, the other thing we're we're looking at right now is we're actually putting in for uh, a CIBR, a small uh, business innovation research uh, proposal. And what we're looking at is to actually apply this technology uh, in more safety and hazardous environments. Uh, think about like chemical factories, plastic factories, oil refineries. Yeah. And one of the things we want to do there is couple our technology with uh, chemical sensors, uh, so you can track exposure. Like how long has somebody been exposed to chemicals, uh, heat, uh, you know, light. Uh, yeah, radiation stuff no, like that. Super good, uh, <clears throat> great stuff. So, uh, if folks wanted to to get in contact with you um, and uh, learn more about Reckon Point. It's uh, R E C K O N P O I N T dot com. That's right. Yeah, that's if, right. If they want to get a hold of us, uh, you can go to uh, reckonpoint dot com, uh, or you can always, uh, you know, you can go on our website, shoot us uh, some information, info at reckonpoint dot com. Here, answer questions and. Uh, you know, feel free to stop by anytime you want and check out the robots. Yeah, no. Well, uh, thanks for uh, joining us on CyberTalk Radio. Thanks for uh, making uh, our airport uh, into a, a super cool place. It's going to have some 
uh, fun new applications uh, for safety and usability out there.